And dare I say that this right now is the beginning of our budding best friendship. The uh, universe has kept us apart uh, up until now. I don't I don't know. I don't know if this is going to be a best <laughs> friendship or not. Listen. <laughs> I'm not a man that deals well with rejection. And like, I've been tried, I've tried inviting you and your husband to dinner at least three times. Now you <laughs> literally live 25 minutes from my house. Where are you actually right now? So we're in. We'll edit that out. I'm in. Edit that oh, out. Okay. Too. Well, actually, actually, it's not that hard to figure out. Like if, if people know roughly the city you're in, they, they can, they can look your address up. It's it, cause it's, it's all public I record. Know. I know. So, I mean, that has happened to us before. So, but we put our house in our, uh, trust. whatever. Yeah. in the trust. Um, but it's somehow people still find it, but I'm always yeah. like, when I like take a picture, I'm like, Oh, should I not? I don't know who cares, whatever. No, I used to do, I used to do that stuff years ago. Like when I was at the height of my fame, I would have people that like, um, people that would call my home and I'm like, how'd you get this number? And there would be like a website that puts like personal information so on, on the website. Weird. So I would go, but it's like fighting a Hydra. The moment you kill one, I you know, know, you block it. Cause there was like these other websites that you could block that stuff. Another one will pop up. But then so it's, it's like, just, it almost confirms that it's you at that point. And they're like, Oh my God. Yes. It's, yeah. it's yeah. bizarre. John's I, been you, getting that a lot lately. Actually. It's weird. Really? Yeah. I know. Yes. It's very disturbing. See now, like now that I've kind of like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not like the hot thing anymore. So people kind of leave me alone and they see me at the store and, and it's just a handshake and man, big fan. And that's about it. Not enough to make you feel good. How uh, much but, better is, do you like that better? Oh, way better. Like yeah. here's, here's the, here's the thing. I'm not like my manager said to me many years ago, he said, you are the guy who works. He said, you're the most famous guy I know that works really diligently at not being famous. <laughs> So, I see you and John are going to be best buds. Yeah. Fortunately for me, I, I competed in the UFC at the time when they needed like that boy next door, apple pie eating, bring home to mom kind of guy that I, you know, I was a high school teacher. I'm intelligent. And, yeah. and they, you know, they marketed all that stuff because they needed it because it, the, the sport wasn't like mixed martial arts wasn't widely accepted at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could survive in today's world where I have, where you attend, essentially you have to be an attention whore and you're out on social media. And every time I make a post on social media, like I'm, I'm in the gym sometimes and I'm recording workouts and I'm like, my God, like, where do the days go where you're like, get that camera out of here. We're working hard. Right. Like, no. and it does, it really doesn't phase how intense my workout is, but at the same time, it's just like, man, I'm just one of those like purists. And so all, all that kind of stuff, I'm like, Oh, I could, I could just do away with it. And so I think I tasted enough fame to realize I really, really don't like fame. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'll have people come up to me and they'll say things like, man, really appreciate all the entertainment you gave us on a Friday night or some, this is my favorite. Like when somebody says to me, Hey, I really appreciate you like being a good role model for my kids or standing up for your faith, your Christian yeah. faith or whatever. When people say those kinds of things to me, I'm like, like rock on, man. Like then I, I did the right thing because we just live in this world today where it's very difficult to look to athletes as role models at times. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, it's kind of like for anybody, it's like anyone that has a bit of a spotlight on them. It's like, you're kind of looking to everybody for answers and for direction on you know, anything, whether it's, um, you know, politics or whatever. I feel like you're looking to anyone with a spotlight on them, which is definitely not the right way to go about it. Like I never post about stuff like that. Cause I'm like, I, that is not my space. That is not for me to like really chime in on. So I always kind of lay low with that. But did you ever have bad experience at a bad experiences at like the height of your fame? Um, no, I mean, you're always like, I always say this, you know, Jesus, he, he only had 12 friends and one of them was a hater. Right. And he was perfect. So, you know, there's like, you can't satisfy everybody. And in that sense, like I would have people that just hated me. I don't know, maybe like I beat up their favorite fighter or something. I don't know. Yeah. Or I mean, I know people that are like, I don't like that guy. He just seems too nice. Like I know people, for example, that don't like Tim Tebow because he just is like, he's just, he's too nice. There's something right. there, you know, and it's like, I don't know what's up with that. Yeah. Too nice like, of yeah. The guy. So you're just, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, but not really. I always, I always had a good following. Um, as an example, I went to, I, at one time I was fairly fluent in Portuguese. And so when I fought Vanderlei Silva, the second time in Belo Horizonte, when I, when I went down to Brazil, 
uh, my, my Portuguese was quite rusty and I'd practiced for like the month leading up to it. And by the, by the end of the week, I was down there almost doing full interviews in Portuguese Damn. and people were like, wow, this is amazing. And I, in that fight, like I remember like, uh, in, in that fight, like they were like chanting when I walked out, kind of like, they, they, they like, Morera, which means like, you're going to die. And oh. Yeah, that's like that's like their version of USA, USA. And they're chanting that. And it's just it's just what they chant. Like, I I guess it's probably like, I don't know, stems from like soccer matches where referees mess up calls or whatever. But he and I went through such a war that by the end of that that fight, it was like my Rocky Four moment where you gain the respect of the locals. And I just eat even walking around afterwards. Like I've always just I've always had a good reception from fans. I've always not to say that there isn't a, a negative experience here and there, but overall, man, I've, I've had some of the best fans in the world. People are just really, really behind me on things. So what was it like for you when you were finally coming to the, to the decision to walk away from the octagon? I was reading your piece that you wrote for the players tribune and it was a conversation with your mom. Oh, well, I mean, I had plenty of conversation with my mom. Did you read my reti- <laughs> the retirement letter that I wrote? Yeah. 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 That's, that's the tough part because people ask you all the time, like, Hey, do you, do you miss, do you miss fighting? I'm like, yeah, I miss fighting. Like, obviously there's, it's in that feeling of having your hand raised and walking out uh, to the arena. It's, it, it's intoxicating. And I always tell people when you, when you break the curtains, I'm getting chills. Literally, I'm getting chills talking about this. Like when you break through that curtain, you know, those lamps that they, that were like really popular in the seventies and eighties where you could touch the, the, the bulb and the little electric things would follow oh, yeah, your yeah. hands around, Yeah, but you could kind of feel the electricity that's what walking out to the arena is like when you walk out it's like you can feel the energy in the air like that just like that lamp and it follows you and that's a very a very addicting feeling truly it is and having your hand raised but i mean make no mistake 10 minutes prior when i'm sitting in the locker room literally about to piss my pants praying to god please let the lights go out or something um (laughs) and then you get your hand raised and then the moment you get your hand raised you're like man i want to do this again but when I'm asked if I ever wanted, like, would, would I ever fight again or do I miss it or whatever? I mean, the answer is yes, I, I absolutely miss it. But that's not the thing I miss. What I miss is, and I wrote about this in my retirement letter, is that when you get ready for a match, it's like a general that is uniting his troops and everybody stands behind you. It doesn't matter if it's your training partners, if it's your coaches, if it's your friends, family members, or just fans that don't know you. I mean, everybody plays their role. Pete, like guys show up to train with me when they're injured. My family would move holidays because I was cutting weight. Like everybody has a piece of that. And when you go out and win, everybody owns a little piece of that victory. And then, but when you lose, everybody suffers a piece of that defeat as well. I mean, I like, you know how it is like you, you I'm sure you know some people that when their favorite team I mean the Bengals just lost the oh, Super Bowl here I, I I don't know how many people in this how city, did you deal with that how was that on you well I'll just say I don't know how many people in this city went into severe depression I was okay because <laughs> if you rewind the clock to the beginning of the season with the Bengals we were never expected to to like do that sure so the fact that we went to the Super Bowl and the fact that we have a young team Mm-hmm. Man, if we can get some linemen, protect Joe Burrows, like th- we have, we have a runway. We really have a runway where we could, we could possibly build a dynasty. So even though we lost, like we played a great game, man. In the fourth quarter there, when they were inside the 10 yard line and, and Los Angeles had like, oh I don't God. know, 10, 10, 10, tries on the goal. Like it was like, Oh, was I don't know, insane. holding half the distance to the goal line, automatic first down. I'm like, Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Another <laughs> personal foul, like four more downs. Like how, how many times can the defense stop them? Like it was just inevitable at that point. And so you kind of, you're just watching it just melt in front of you. But, yeah. um, but no, I was, I was still excited. I'm like, man, they played, they played their hard outs. It was a great season. And uh, I'm, I'm amped for next season for the potential of next season. You are the King of Cincinnati, like born, raised, stayed here. You've got your day here. You've got, you've got, do you have a key to the city? No, I don't. I don't have a key to the city. What? I, I think I think I just need like a, an agent that would push for that or something. There's there's a day here. I got I got a day in this. I city. know February 26, right? But I, if you say so, I, I don't think, know. I mean, I'm I'm I, I barely remember my birthday at times. And it'd be February 26. 
because I was I was like doing my research for this interview and I was like John he has a day because John feels like because now he's back in Cincinnati that he's like the the prodigal son has returned yeah. um but yeah I'm like dude you're being beat out big time here by Rich Franklin because listen you, you've got I, like, the city locked down you have like you have uh you have uh, Aaron Pryor uh -huh. and then and then like what other champions are there in the city right yeah I mean yeah where else I mean Pete Rose yeah, but I mean, Pete kind of got ostracized. That's questionable, right? Yeah. Well, I but he, I mean, honestly, I mean, when I don't know, I have my opinions on that, and I don't, I really think that the reaction to Pete on this entire thing is a bit harsh. But I, when you look at what that man did in baseball, it's just amazing. Uh, of you course. know, it, it, nobody will ever break his hit record. And I mean, what would he? Uh, what, he, he was a. Uh, I'm not it's not pro ball. What's what's it called? Why am I lost for the don't word? Don't ask me. I don't know shit about baseball. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, like he, like he played, like he played, like nine different positions on the field. You know, I think hero. pretty much everything, but but pitcher Give and catcher. Give the man his flowers. Give the man his flowers. Yeah. Um, why do you love Cincinnati so much? I mean, you, like I said, you were born here, raised here. You went to college here. You were teaching here as well, right? Like you've yeah, I, ta I taught. I uh, taught over at Oak Hills. So I mean, well, first of all, it's my home, and secondly you know, having gone through my career and you see the way that the city reacts to that, it was, um, you know, that was a, it was a big deal here in Cincinnati and, and know. just, you know, I'm, I'm, I was like, I'm on the news every other week. If I'm not fighting, people are talking about my last fight or talking about something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of my biggest disappointments was uh, fighting Anderson here the second time at right. us bank and losing that match. Uh, you know, that's your, that's your childhood Cinderella story. Right. Yeah. And when you come up short, it's like, Oh God, man like that was my my one chance to do that now thank god at least i did win a fight in ohio because i fought in columbus one time and, and won that match so I, at least i'm 500 in ohio right now but <laughs> you know but the, the the city was just really receptive and that was at a time when mma wasn't highly valued or accepted uh, you know john mccain was referring to it as human cockfighting and so yeah. i mean you know being in Ohio, this is a conservative place. Cincinnati is a conservative town. And so for people to really embrace something like that early on in the sport, I think speaks volumes of, of the people here. And then of course, you know, why do I love Cincinnati so much? I mean, this is, it's this kind of lifestyle. You know, I spent four and a half years living in Singapore. I've spent a couple of years living in LA at one point, spent a couple of years up in Seattle. And uh, it's just like the, the lifestyle here, the, the land, the, you know, things like hunting. And, and I, I mean, I'm a true Midwesterner. I like shooting guns. I like hunting. I like my ATVs. I like space. I drive four wheel drive vehicles. Like I'm that guy. And <laughs> when, when you take me out of that environment, um, <laughs> like, I, I don't know how Get to a little function. Cagey. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm either in the gym lifting weights and getting a pump on, or I'm outside getting dirty. It's one of the two. It's funny that like, okay, so we don't have like ATVs or like neither of us know how to shoot a gun, none of those things. But I like, we just moved here five months ago, four or five months ago. Listen, Renee, and the fact that you've been here for four or five months and you A, haven't asked me to take you guys shooting or B, <laughs> uh, gone out and went ATV riding with me is a problem. That well, speaks volumes of nice your character. Weather now, but <laughs> it was cold. Now we can. There been, there been I'm several, of the cold. there've been several 70 degree days. And by the way, like I, you, you bring the baby up, I'll, I'll, I'll put a, I'll put a pellet gun in her hand. <laughs> Actually, I did have her on the back of my, uh, of my father-in-law's ATV. I was like, we just got to take like a quick little spin on this thing. Yeah. So she did good, but no, Cincinnati is a very underrated city. Oh, absolutely. I had no idea. It's beautiful here. It's like, listen, I feel like it's a little kept secret. Oh, it is. And I, so I don't even like talking about this kind of stuff, but Cincinnati, first of all, if you're a family person, it's a great place to raise a family. It's big enough that there are things to do here. I mean, like we have the Aronoff Center, so you can go see plays and symphonies. There's there's great art museum here, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Or it's centrally located in an area where you can get to places like, you, I mean, you can get to a place like a Lake Norris or a Red River Gorge to hike, or it's not far from like Snowshoe if you want to go skiing. Now, East Coast skiing isn't the same as West Coast skiing. I'll I take it. whatever I can get. Right, but like it's it's a fairly well-located city and on top of it i read this stat and this this is an old stat but um i read this one time like on a plane in a business insider or whatever magazine i was reading it was like cincinnati had more fortune 500 companies per capita wow. than any other city in the united states per capita and yeah. so there's a there's a lot of work here and the nice thing i like about cincinnati is it's it's big enough to to have some 
entertainment and maybe some culture, but at the same time, it's small enough to fly under the radar. And that's, yeah. that's what I love about it because I can see the population growth in the last, I mean, every time I'm, I'm out of, out of the city for a little while and I come back, I'm like, man, traffic's getting thicker. It's more and more <laughs> difficult to cross the bridge. Yeah. And so I don't know if Cincinnati is that best kept little secret anymore. I think like, I think the, you know, the cat's out of the bag. It's funny. Cause like when we were figuring out where we wanted to move and what we were going to do, and John would always joke, he's like, guess we're going to move back to Cincinnati. And I was, I had I really didn't know what it was like here. And as soon as we like really checked it, I was like, dude, it's awesome here. Yeah. Like well, it has all of the things, but you've been here for the, you've been here for the crap weather, but I know the, the nice thing about Cincinnati is that realistically uh, as April, uh, you know, we'll have a couple weeks of rain and usually about mid April, the temperatures, I mean, we've had a couple 70 plus degree days now. Yeah. And so you, that's kind of a taste of what the spring is like. And we'll have that all the way up until mid to late June. And then it'll get hot for July and August. It'll feel like that Florida weather. And mm -hmm. then, um, then in September it starts to cool down and you can have that same potential all the way up until mid November, you know, where you're yeah, still getting 70 it. degree days. And it's like, I love it. man, to go from, basically mid April to mid November and to have the occasional outliers. Like, I mean, we had 60 degree days in December here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it which it, is terrible for me because it's like, it'll snow and then you'll have like five days of cold and then it snows on the last day. Then it suddenly goes up to 60 and just screws everything up. Like you can't actually, you know, go out and I'll go to perfect North. We have artificial slopes here, which aren't I bad. Just, so for... John got me a ticket or got me passes for that for Christmas. And I've not used them yet. Oh, well, you're so, not going to use them this wait, year. Wait, Do you ski or snowboard board? Which one? Uh, okay. Oh, Great. no, my then board's we... not in the corner. Usually I have my board leaning in the corner. Then there but... we have another activity that we can knock off on our list of, of best friendship. Listen, Renee, if you and John are into things like I'm a man that has more activities than free time, like I have way more hobbies than I do free time. So well, we're going to make some stuff happen. Yeah. Um, I feel like we just uh, did an entire podcast for the um, tourism board of Cincinnati. Right. Um, how I'm not, and I'm not I'm not even on payroll there, <laughs> nor am I. Um, how shocking was it for you for that time that you spent in Singapore? For you to oh. go from living in Cincinnati to being transported into Singapore, what did that do to you? Well, I wasn't and obviously going to Singapore for one championship. Yeah, well, I wasn't shocked because I had been working for one several years prior to moving down there. Right. I mean, oh. I think I'm coming up on either eight or nine years with the company now. Dang. 2013. Is that when I started? 2013, 2014. I don't know. But either way, I had I had worked for them for several years and I traveled in and out of uh, Singapore and just Southeast Asia in general. Mm -hmm. And I've done quite a bit of travel. I've been to about 65 countries at this point. So being out of the country, I'm not really shocked by things because I love that feeling of like, man, you don't see that every day. And that's what really gets me excited when but I travel. But that's still but, different than like living. Oh, somewhere. yeah. And but to say I had actually spent some time in Singapore, like you spend concentrated time in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And so going down there, I kind of knew what I was getting into. And for people that have never been to Asia, like or the people that moved to Singapore, they call Singapore like Asia light because mm -hmm. it's you're in a country where English is the predominant language. Uh, Chinese is the second language. And oh, they'll wow. typically they typically teach like kids in school are taught whatever language is native to their parents tongue. So if you're Indian, like you would be taught um, Hindi or, you know, you know, whatever. And then if you're Chinese, like you're so on and so forth. And so it, living out of the country, as far as ease, Singapore is about the best place you could possibly live because everything's in English. It's easy to navigate. Like, and as far as the country goes, Singapore is the most organized, technologically advanced, efficient city slash country Loves i've ever been efficiency. to in my life oh my god not yeah. to compare anything to my my only like asian city i had been to was going to japan and that's the thing i took away i was like man everything is so efficient here yeah the way that like your takeout is packed up to the way yep. the rooms are organized like everything is accounted for in the most manageable way it's amazing yeah. And then, you know, on the, on the other side of things, like Singaporean people are, are quite friendly. Um, there's, you know, especially to, to expats and people that aren't from the country, mm -hmm. um, very welcoming. And so just, it, it, it's, it's a very safe place. It's one of those places where crime, it's like crime is so rare that if like you leaned your bicycle against a tree and grabbed a coffee and somebody stole your bike, they literally will put a sandwich board out on the street. Like this is a crime area. As if like a murder happened. It's, 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 it's just crazy. You can, so 
here, I'll give you an example. It's called choping. So you can, when you go to like a, 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 they're called hawker centers. If you go to a hawker center to eat and you're eating outdoors, you'll do what's called choping a table. So you'll typically take like some napkins or something and set them down on the table. Mm -hmm. Singapore is the one place where you can chope with your cell phone. You literally set the cell phone on the table, walk away, go to the food stall, get your food, come back to the table five, 10 minutes later, cell phone will still be there. Wow. Yeah. Kudos to the Singaporean people. Yeah. Not, not to say that there isn't the occasional bad hat. apple. There is the sure. occasional bad apple. Don't you know, but nonetheless, like it's just, it's, it's one of those places, but on top of that, you, so do it's, it's like the Canada of Asian cities. <laughs> I guess I guess you could say that. None exactly. of us lock our doors. I leave yeah, my wallet no. places. Oh, there's like, I don't even know. I don't even know why they give out keys in Singapore. Honestly, <laughs> there's there's no need for it. But um, but no, it's it, it it truly is one of those places. But I mean, at the same time, I'll say this: having traveled to places like Jakarta or Bangkok or Ho Chi Minh or what any other major Manila, any other major Asian city. Singapore's laid out fairly well, like it's quite spacious. But when I moved there, having been from the Midwest, God, it felt so like I bet. condensed, right? Um, but no, I, I mean, I had a nice condo over there. I was only, you know, a few minutes from a park. And, I, you know, I would, I would ride down to the park oftentimes, do these workouts outside on the pull-up bars down there. And, mm -hmm. and it was just, yeah, nice. And it's the, the beautiful thing about that. I mean, if you like warm weather, I call it the rule rule of nineties. It's 90, 90 plus degrees and 90 plus percent humidity every single oh day. Oh my so God. You never wake up cold. Like, or those like creaking bones, like, Oh man, whatever. You're just always ready to go. Exactly. Um, okay. So how was the suit life treating you? I mean, like you said, you've been there eight, nine years working with one, but I mean, as a vice president, CEO, how was that transition and how did that opportunity even come about for you to start working with them? Well, I, I went down to Singapore, uh, years ago. And I had actually taught a seminar at uh, Evolve with m one of my coaches, with Matt Hume. And this was before, before I was retired and, and before I started working for them. And when I got down there, I just met the right people. And they basically said, hey, if you were ever be interested in a job post-career, let us know. And uh, so then when my career was coming to an end, it, um, you know, I, I was like looking like, well, what am I going to do next? And so contacted those people I'm like yeah we would love to have you on board and fortunately I guess for me or them or whatever uh, you know having a math degree like I'm a very left brain numbers driven kind of guy so uh, you know I've done so many different things for the company and uh and I guess with me it's not I'm not just like a spokesperson like you actually get a real employee when you hire me you know because <laughs> like, a lot of athletes get hired and people just are like smoke well, and mirrors but you're yeah what, what do they actually do for the company yeah so but the interesting thing is that when, when one hired me initially, I don't think they really knew how to place me in the company. And so I was like, um, I was like one of those football players on, on the field that was like playing different positions all the time. The utility they like, guy. Yeah. Yeah. Like go do this. Like we need you to catch this ball this time. Mm -hmm. uh, no, this time we're going to give you the ball. And if you could throw it for us, that'd be great. <laughs> and so I did that for a while and then things started to, uh, to they, like, it started to kind of like close in. And so for a while I, I started help setting up their, their merchandising system because I had at one point in time had my own clothing brand. Yeah. But then ultimately uh, Chatri came to me and said, Hey, I want you to, and I was not interested. He said, I want you to run this. I got this idea. It's a travel show and I want you to travel around and recruit talent. Think of Anthony Bourdain meets MMA. And I looked at him straight up. And I was like, Chatri. I don't, I don't have the time for this. Like I got you, I, I'm doing like five different jobs for the company right now. And he's that like, Nope. would be such a fun job. Though. Oh, it's amazing. And so that ran for about two and a half years, one warrior series. Actually it was called rich Franklin's one warrior series. Yeah. And, um, and I, like he was literally, he just says to me, I, I, you, you talked about my studio setup, right? Like <laughs> I had no clue, not like other than, I, I mean, I had been on a couple of reality shows. I've done a little bit and I ask questions and I'm, I'm, definitely a curious person and, and always learning and which is why I like having a podcast but at the same time like I'd never run a production crew and he basically was like go and I had nobody and I so I had to build a team so oh I God. ended up uh, building a team I had hired four people these are like my core advisors and with them and I, I surrounded myself with the right people and then after two and a half years, like we really, I mean, we, we made a great product. And so we did six seasons of that show. The first four are on, on YouTube and mm -hmm. you can tell a difference from season one to season four, 
But um, man, season five and six, like then we started monetizing it and selling it to different media partners overseas. But it, I, I'm telling you, that was the, I always said like, God really gig. looks out for me. Yeah, God, I'm telling you, God is, God has really directed my path, Renee, because I always like, first of all, like not, not being a starting athlete from a high school football team and then winning a world title that in itself is like, how does that happen? But secondly, <laughs> I said to myself, when I'm done fighting, I want to be able to travel because all the travel I did while I was in competition you never was saw based thing. around, yeah, was, I didn't get to see anything. Right. Yeah. And so then suddenly it's like, well, here's your job. And so my job, literally I had, I had a team of 15 people underneath me and their job was essentially to just like plan a cool vacation. And, and so, oh you know, gosh. one, one episode we're hiking to some Buddhist temple in the middle of uh, these jungles in Myanmar. And the next time we're jumping off of a waterfall in the middle of the Philippines. And then the next time we're, well, you know, hang gliding in, in, uh, in Australia. And, oh and gosh. literally I did all of these things on top of all the MMA that was attached to it, but truly a great job. And then COVID hit. Yep. And, and then, you know, that obviously is a game changer for travel and whatnot. And so now I'm here in the U S just working with one's expansion into the U S territory. You must've had a ton of other broadcast opportunities come your way. I mean, you're obviously perfect for it. Was that what did like a bunch of other stuff come your way in terms of that? No, I'm, well, I mean, people, I mean, people will offer things, but I've, you know, I've been with one they and yeah. I'm happy with the company. And so I like, I'm, I'm just not one of the people that I, I like, I don't, my eyes don't wonder ever. Right. Um, I'm, I'm with a company. I like the mission that we have and, and they take good care of me. I have a great relationship. So I've never really thought about going anywhere else. Yeah. Well, fair enough. Fair enough. I'm just saying you got the chops <laughs> to get out there. If you were like hosting some stuff or, I mean, you know, obviously being able to do that show, uh, with one anyways, but, um, okay. One X mm. coming up. I'm so excited. This show, I'm telling oh you. Oh my gosh. Show, first of all, this show is like this show, you, you like I, Renee, I'm sure you've watched like uh I don't know, um boxing matches before where yeah. the only like you pretty much have to sit through an entire terrible boxing match so that you one, can yeah, see just the main event. And yeah, but yeah. this show, I mean, top to bottom, it's I don't know, 20 matches. I think it's 20 matches. I think it's 20 matches, yeah. Yeah. And, and they're so it's broken all... into three parts. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Let me, let me get this straight. The yeah, help me out. I'm like, I was like looking at it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is no. like, so part one starts at 1 PM. Okay. So the show is March 26th. That's Saturday. Yeah. So, and it'll start at one in the afternoon, but that's Asia time. So, or that's Singapore time. So in East coast time, it'll start at 1 AM. Okay. And that's part one. And then part two starts at 5 a.m. East Coast time. And then part three starts at. I think 8 a.m., right? Maybe 8 a.m. Yeah. I want to and say so, And so that's like, I'll be, I'll be commentating on, on, on a uh, part of this show. Yeah. And you get to do that all from home. Um, yeah, no, I, I will be. I'm, I'm, I'm awesome. kind of brought in just uh, for, for audio. So I'll be doing some fight analysis scoring and uh, and whatnot so it'll be pretty cool but have you had to do that from home before when no. without actually being there that's gonna no, be a no. bit of a trip yeah we we actually uh we actually this week we're running com tests making sure that did mansuri uh, set that up ev yeah everything well of course he, he, he set it up but i was working with uh with a different producer on it so okay but um yeah it'll be and he'll he'll be the one in my ear on on saturday yelling at me he's a good guy to have in your ear Oh, I, I, from man, sorry. You know what the crazy thing is? I like, I love Mike. He's awesome. Um, <laughs> and we have never, we've never met in person. I've like, he's been working for the company and yeah. he took the job and he's down in Singapore. Now I was up in New York and like two times I'm going to New York and he's leaving like the day before I get there or vice versa. And so we've never actually met face to face. So but, your guy's uh, but, best friendship is also being dodged. Yeah, exactly. But I, I mean, I will say this, though. I get plenty of FaceTime with Mike. Like, this is mm -hmm. the first FaceTime. I've invited you to dinner three times. I'm just going to start FaceTime. randomly FaceTiming you. Okay, just to clear it up for the people, by the way. So we were scheduled to go to dinner, me, you, and John. Was this the we, second time or third time? I can't this, even remember. <laughs> I can't remember at this point. My heart is so full of rejection that, that, that I, like, hold on. But I think my earphones are not working. We got blasted with snow. 
it, we got blasted with snow so bad. We were ready to go. And then John's mom called and was like, I can't get out of my driveway. It's simply yeah. not happening. Um, and then I had to bail on doing this interview yesterday because my daughter got a stomach bug, which then I got. I've not had oh. a stomach bug for like a decade. Oh, my God. But did you I, ever did I you lived. ever get COVID? Did, did you get COVID? I did. I got COVID twice. How bad was it? Uh, the first time was definitely worse. But the first time I got it was like pretty early on to COVID. So I think I was so freaked out by everything that I was like, oh my God. I'm gonna die. But like, yeah, I th I'm going down. This is it. Um, it was bad, but I I just didn't have a fever for any of it. But I had kind of all the other symptoms with it. But yeah, it was not great. Did you get yeah, it? Yeah, I had it. I had it back um, on, during Thanksgiving. Oh, and this, like just this last Thanksgiving? Yeah. And yeah. I've only had it once, but. And the, the whole trial and, you know, the funny thing is, is that I like I always thought like because there are some people I, I have friends I have. I mean, I have friends that have been all, near death with this thing. Oh and I have God. some friends that are like, yeah, I had the sniffles for like 20 minutes. And yeah. I thought I would be that guy because I'm like all organic eating, exercising. Like I'm that guy. Right. So I'm like, whatever, bring it. And then I, I got I got this thing and it lasted for about 12 days in total. Um, but I had four days in the middle of that where I got hit with every single symptom you can think of simultaneously loss of taste, loss of smell, oh temperature. I had nausea in my stomach. I had this situation with my skin where I, I remember one night I was taking a shower and I did, and I didn't realize that I, I, I didn't turn on the cold water. It was all hot and I couldn't tell. Like it was oh. like my skin was numb, but then I crawled into my bed and I was under the covers and the covers on my skin. They, when, when they were like, when they were rubbing me, it felt like it was like somebody was taking like a steel brush and just scraping it all. Oh, it was terrible. Like everything hurt. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't sleep. And I was just like, for four days, I was like, man, I'm like, Lord, just, just take me. Like, <laughs> I'm just horrible. like, I'm done. I'm just, I'm just sick of this thing. Like yeah, I'd rather, like I'd rather come hang and, out with you. The aches and pains were like the worst part for me. Yeah. Where I was just like, Oh my God. Like my elbows hurt. My hands hurt. Yeah. So brutal. I never, uh, I never had trouble breathing or anything of that nature. I never felt like my life was in danger. It was just like, just miserable. I was just yeah. like, oh. I did have a little bit of like, I got a heavy chest the first time. But I think also, like I said, it's like because it was early on, I think it was also like a little bit of just like anxiety where I'm like, oh, can I breathe? Yeah, can I breathe? Yeah. OK, I think I kept like kind of checking myself. Um, anyways, my stomach bug was not that it still sucked, but it was not. It wasn't. COVID. Well, hold on. All this to say, how's your daughter doing? She's good. My daughter has bounced back. She's okay. good. She had it. She was sick for like three days. I was sick for like maybe 12 hours. Right. So, but yeah, she, she's good. She's good. She's rebounded. She's like back in her jolly jumper, ready to party. She's, Roger, she's all good. good. Yeah, then. she's all good. Um, okay. So back to one X because I had to like write this down. So the main event, of course, Angela Lee defending the Adam weight world championship against stamp Fairtex. Now stamp, yes. did stamp come off of your show? She did. So stamp actually, when I was doing the one warrior series, that was my first stop. We went to Bangkok and I was holding these tryouts. I, and I love telling this story. I tell it all the time. I'm watching these. I'm watching two guys try out on the mat and I'm just watching and I'm watching. I'm like, OK, OK. And then all of a sudden I just hear this like, boom. And I'm and it sounded like a cannon went off. And I was like, what was that? Boom. And I'm like, whoa. And I look sideways and there's this tiny little girl just smashing <laughs> the pads. I mean, and suddenly now I'm watching these two guys try out like this. <laughs> and uh and so i mean i was immediately i'm like I, I knew right away i was like this girl she's going somewhere and so she was obviously trying out for an mma show but her background is in muay thai and there's there's a really good documentary on stamp called buffalo girls because a lot of what ends up happening with a lot of families in thailand is they will put their kids in competitive muay thai like actual competition at a young age to help earn household income so oh, wow. at the age of like six, this girl, I mean, there's, there's video footage of her fighting at the age of six, like having been trained. And I mean, this isn't like just throw some, some gloves on some kids. Like these kids are already trained to, you know, like train killers in the making. Yeah. And so it's, it's pretty crazy watching that. And, and I mean, they'll fight and, and for basically peanuts, but I mean, this is a family's ability to put food on the table essentially. So, you know, she had been competing since the age of six and it obviously showed when she tried out, but 
the thing I liked about Stamp is I remember watching her when she was actually doing the MMA portions, like watching her grappling, and I could tell that she was green, but she was in the right camp. And, and you you just know when somebody has that learning curve, like I just knew right away. And so she competed for me one time. Knox, oh, I can't remember her opponent's name, but Knox's girl out in like 10 seconds with a head kick. And I think that she was actually just like kind of throwing the kick as a setup and planned on like grappling, like working her MMA game. But then the kick landed and it just pretty much that was the end of it. And uh, one championship immediately was like, no, we want her. So they pulled her because my league was the recruiting league, the Warriors mm -hmm. series. And they pulled her right away. Uh, she ended up she ended up championing in um, Muay Thai and kickboxing. And then later on, now she works her way through the MMA ranks. And the thing I love about Stamp is that she's one of those people where you can see her brain working in, in the circle. Like she, she'll try to do things sometimes, even as a coach, I'm like, man, like you're being too reckless. Like, don't, don't go for this move when you're on top side control, like coast this out, pepper this girl, with some punches to the face, like whatever. And she'll give up top side position to go for some submission that she has not yet quite perfected, at least for not for competition and I like her i like her a lot well and so you can see this and she, she she'll take risks in matches and at, if i was her coach i'd be like listen you got to you got to take intelligent risks here but all that to say i mean she came through the adam weight grand prix and ended up the the final match against ritu fogat which is the one of the best wrestlers we have in one championship male female doesn't matter but she is one of the best wrestlers we have in one championship and she just has a reputation for smashing people passing them and just bashing them and stamp ends up beating this girl with an arm bar wow and i'm completely like and but you can see this evolution happening over time and when you look at this matchup with stamp i mean this is this is a great matchup and in, in, or this matchup with angela like angela's kind of in a similar situation she's been training since she was six years old as well mm -hmm. obviously not fighting to provide for the family but all the meanwhile like angela's dad ken lee is just genetically engineered her children to be champions it's and crazy so that like their whole family is part of one like it's exactly. wild so the big question for me here is which Angela is going to show up, right? I mean, I'm not a mother. I've never had children. I, I can't birth a child. So has her priorities changed? Is her priority being a champion or is her priority having a, a, a baby now? And are those mom, two things mom's mutually strength exclusive? is something to me mess with, though. Mom's yeah, strength I, will get you. Yeah, so, I, so I don't know. Like, but but you might she might have the strength, but has she been like training or is she – you know, she's spent spending time with the baby at home. Who sure. knows? Like this is this is the X factor, pun intended on one X, the, as 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 this thing unfolds. So that really is something that like kind of blows my mind. And when you see women that juggle those things between having a baby, getting back to fighting right away, like you know, I've been talking to to Misha Tate about that when she was doing that as well. When she had yeah. her, when she had, I think it was when she had her son in getting like right either way her daughter or her son i think she was fighting maybe in between but um yeah just to get back and like ronda rousey came back to wrestling four months yep. after having her baby i just don't know how their bodies can do that it blows my mind like right. having a kid and i don't have to fight anybody but day to day i'm like is it bedtime yet like i'm ready to shut it down and for them <laughs> to be like no i'm gonna go into train right now is like holy get after it girl but like yeah that, no I'm I, not cut that's out that's that. out of my area of expertise because i don't have any i don't have any experience with uh you know post baby training personally <laughs> like, i mean like, not that you would know about this either but i'll throw it out there but like misha tate was breastfeeding when she went in for her last fight and i was oh. like well i so the, i mean get this i had interviewed uh bethany hamilton you know bethany hamilton yeah soul surfer so i interviewed her for my podcast oh like, wow she's fascinating she's an amazing amazing woman but there like she was talking about when they did uh, i can't remember was like whatever the the world championships that were in australia or whatever for or, or was it in french polynesia i don't know whatever but she was in the middle of the competition literally like surfed one heat come out breastfeeding her baby on the boat <laughs> in between heats like this is insane and i'm just sitting there like how do you women are crazy energy? women are crazy right we're yeah. nuts we take yeah. it all on we make it all happen you got to be fed you got to be fed championships got to be won let's go i'm telling you right now like if as a man if if like if the roles were reversed and the man had to take care of all that like it would be like me breastfeeding for 20 minutes i'd be like man i breastfed the kid today like i'm tired like leave me alone <laughs> I will say at one point, I'm like, this burns calories, right? Great. Here we go. <laughs> there you go. That's, it, it does, though. Um, okay. So you have to finally pick Angela Lee or Stamp. Who's
Who's getting who's getting the W? Um, you making me you, uh, how I mean, how can that's how can you pick when you don't have all the information, right? Like you're looking at a puzzle without all the pieces. And so I want a good educated Rich Franklin guess. But, but I already I already gave my educated guess. Listen, if if Angela if Angela's been on point with her training the way that she should, then I don't believe that Stamp has quite had the time to close the gap yet on the gotcha. grappling game. Gotcha. I do believe it will be in Angela's best interest to close the gap and, you know, take stamp to the ground, obviously, but I don't think stamp's going to be able to keep up on the ground. So my, if, if, if I was a gambling man, like if I had to make a bet, I would probably bet Angela just based on experience. But I'll say this, if Angela slept at all on her training or she has underestimated stamp in any way, the, the, you know, a year and a half ago, like the gap between them was like this. And it's like this, and I'm telling you right now, give Stamp another year, and it's game over because that girl has an exponential learning curve for martial arts. And so, yeah. What are the odds of being a really great martial artist and your name is Stamp? How cool. Right? Get it, girl. Yeah. Um, the co-main. I, and like the co-main, this is, you got, you're going to have to spell this one out for me. So Demetrius Johnson yeah. versus Road Tang. Uh, yeah. Special rules, super fight. The first and third rounds are contested under Muay Thai rules. The second and fourth round are contested under the MMA rules. MMA rules, yeah. Holy. So this, yeah, this is cool. But let me take a step back and just say, so as, as an MMA promotion, technically, one, we, you know, they're putting on MMA matches. And then we, Chantry some years ago, they come up with this idea of like, hey, let's do some Muay Thai. Let's do some kickboxing. And I was of this mind, mindset of like, I don't come to an MMA event to watch Muay Thai, right? Like I, I was not a fan. And, and then, so I was like, I just don't like this idea. And then we had our first event and we had some Muay Thai kickboxing matches. And then I kind of begrudgingly internally walked away. Like, I actually like that. <laughs> and, and so and then as time went on i found myself really looking forward to a lot of these muay thai matchups particularly i would say for me personally the muay thai matchups more so than the kickboxing because our muay thai is done in the four ounce gloves the, the mma style gloves not the big boxing gloves mm -hmm. so these matches are really exciting and you look at raw tang I, raw tang won a lot of fans over here stateside when we had our show on tnt at last year yep. and he he just he had an amazing match against daniel williams and uh and just he's just he's just one of those guys that's fun to watch and so we decided to do this hybrid match and for me this is really exciting because it's something different it's not something that you would see in any any other organization and it kind of gives you this nostalgic throwback to the original days of mma when it was karate versus judo or jujitsu right. versus boxing and so that's kind of what this is so it's a four round it's a four round fight three minute rounds one minute break in between standard and the first round is going to be muay thai and the second round's mma third round muay thai fourth round mma and so the question here obviously I, well i'll just say this these muay thai strikers on the other side of the planet they are on a different level of striking completely a completely different level the first time i actually worked with a, a a Muay Thai athlete, his name was a Ronan War Pechpoon. And he and I sparred together. And just from a, a pure Muay Thai perspective, like it was ridiculous how he was always on balance. Every time I threw a kick, I got kicked either before my kick landed or in return two or three more times. And, and so it's just a completely different level. And with that, I wonder if DJ is going to play the game safe, clinch, tie up, try to mitigate as much damage as he possibly can, you know, weather the storm for that first three minutes and take Rod Tang into the second three minute round, or if he's going to come out and actually try his hand at Muay Thai, because after all, DJ, in my opinion, is probably the goat. And if anybody's capable of coming out and putting on a good performance with Muay Thai, it would be him. But in my opinion, the path of least resistance for him would be to not be arrogant enough to play that game with a guy like Rod Tang, because this dude is like a miniature little Mike Tyson Damn. and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and take him into your game, take him down get him on the ground and get that submission. Who else is another fighter that people should keep their eye on, on, on this one X card. Yeah. Oh man. I mean, there's so many, so many great Matt Hall. Let me pull this up. There's so many good matches on this card. Okay. First of all, uh, you got the, the, I guess the Coco main event is Adriano Marias versus Yuya Wakamatsu and Adriano turned a lot of heads. Well, for those of us in Asia, we knew how good Adriano was, but I think he turned a lot of heads stateside here when he beat Demetrius on the TNT shows last year. 
on the ground. And I, and I knew personally, I knew that that was not the best matchup for DJ just because, I mean, Adriano and DJ are very similar fighters. They're both really well-rounded, but Adriano is a lot taller. He had a, a good reach advantage on, on Dimitri. So him and, and Yuya Wakamatsu, the only person that Yuya Wakamatsu has lost to in his like last 10 matches is DJ because they met in a grand prix that we had. And, uh, and he gave DJ everything he could handle. So I look for that match to be really, really, really exciting match. Um, I mean, Shin Yaoki versus uh, Sexy Yama. Those two guys really don't like each other. Sexy Yama, what a good yeah. name. Yeah, Yoshihiro Akiyama. He goes by Sexy Yama. I like it. And uh, yeah, and then, but I mean, like working on down the card, I mean, you know, part two of the card, you got like, you got Nong O, you got uh, Ham Seo uh, He, who was, she's fighting Denise Zamboanga. And they actually met in the Adam Waite Grand Prix that the one that's the Grand Prix that Stamp won in order to get the shot at Angela. And it was a very, very razor close split decision between the two of them. But uh, Hamseo, he won that match and uh, it, it was a good match, too. And so but then she ended up breaking her hand and there was a bit of a bit of a controversy in the decision. A lot of the Filipino community was like, no, 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 no. Denise won that match. But it, it was close. And so nonetheless, they've got some unfinished business, bad blood there. Uh, so that's uh, that's a match I'm really looking forward to, because I would say that um Zamboanga was probably the favorite to win the Grand Prix possibly but I had selected uh Hamseo He as my dark horse uh possible tournament winner so that's going to be interesting and I think the winner of that match will set themselves up for probably the number one contender position mm -hmm. but then like even on part one of the card I would say the, the coolest match that we have on that card and it happens to be a grappling match is we have a two division champion uh Renier de Ritter and he's taking on Andre Galvao in a in a in a submission grappling match, and you know any, anybody that's listening, if you know who, I mean, if you're not familiar with who Andre Galvao is, this guy is like accolades beyond accolades of you know Brazilian Jiu Jitsu champion, just a world champion, Pan Am Games, ADCC, all that kind of stuff. He's just he's an amazing grappler. I've actually been on the mat with him before, and it was one of those eye-opening moments for me where I learned that there was a whole new level of Jiu Jitsu in this sport. Um, so for people that have not watched one before, why should they tune in to one X to get a little taste of what you guys are doing over there? Well, uh, first of all, if you've never, if you've never seen one before, what's your problem? Yeah. What's right? your problem? Get with it. Get your I finger mean, on the pulse. Let's go. Exactly. Uh, I, I, I would say this, I really like I, my, the thing that I like about one championship is our rule set. We have a slightly different rule set that it's not the actual rules themselves that make it different, but the way that we judge the matches, um, we don't use a 10 point must system like boxing or like pretty much every other martial arts organization on the planet. We use, uh, we basically judge the fight in its entirety. So the fight is just essentially like one big round and you keep track of things. So there is no stealing around or, I mean, I've been, I've actually uh, suffered from this in that in my career where you have, two rounds where you maybe like squeak out and lose two rounds, but then you win one very decisively. Mm. And it's like, how can you award 10 minutes of a, a match? Right. It's like if, yeah. if the most decisive piece happened in a, a minute of the match or whatever. So I really like the way that our judging system is and, and the way that we judge the matches and our scoring criteria really pushes the athletes for finishes. And so we have a high finish rate in one championship. So you will see, I mean, not only you just, you just see top level world talent, but at the same time, you see some very, very exciting matches with high finish rates. Yeah. And what are you going to be calling? What, what are you going to be on the call for? I'm going to be calling. I will be probably be doing an analyst work and then uh, scoring like end of for round the scoring. whole show. I think I'm doing part, I'm doing part two and three. Okay. Yeah. That's so, that's going to be a lot. You're going to have to like have some tea and some honey next to you. Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm high on life, Renee. <laughs> Who needs caffeine? I got endorphins. I'm I'll just, just do, I'll just do some pushups. Vocal cords. Good. Keep things, I'll do some, <laughs> keep things moving. I can, I can do this all day long. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to watch it. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing uh, this card, how it all comes together, because it yeah, it just seems really innovative, really, really fun, and a lot of badasses over there. It's going to be a good time. And so uh, after you watch this card, then you and John can give me a buzz, and we can go get that. Well, right, just so you know, right now, I'm actually trying out. I interviewed uh, Sean Baker for my podcast, who mm -hmm. wrote The Carnivore Diet. So I'm doing this carnivore diet right now. I'm oh, about, how's that I'm about, going? Yeah, I'm about 12 days in and I don't really, 
I don't feel any different. It's just um, meat, right? Everything is just meat and protein. Well, I, if you read his book, there's no hard rules to it. I mean, you just, he, he, his belief is that you get all the vitamins and minerals that you need from meat. You don't need anything else, but you can eat whatever else you want, just as long as you have this foundation in animal products. So, but I'm basically eating pretty much just meat and eggs. And I do, uh, I do give myself like a serving of fruit either before or after my workouts every day, okay. just, just so I have a little, you know, little, little sugar in my system. You're out there eating like a brown bear. It, pretty much. Damn. That's yeah. I, I'm not living by that diet right now, um, but I'm sure that we can meet in the middle. We'll find something that appeals to both of us. Well, All I'm saying is if you, if you guys uh, still want to grab some sushi at Teak, have you I been yet? To. No, but I pass it all the time. Well, listen, I'm telling you right now, you know. if you guys, after I invited you to that restaurant, if you go eat at that restaurant <laughs> without me, that like so that will rude. solidify <laughs> any friendship that we ever could have possibly have had is not happening. We would just never, FYI. we would never. Um, and I will leave you on this question. Skyline or gold star? Oh, uh, well, I mean, first of all, I don't, I don't ever really eat either of them because wow. Uh, no, I'm mean, like, do you know anything about my nutrition? Well, I mean, I do now. Oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. Like I, I live this, I mean, I'm, I say I'm terrible, but I'm the exact opposite. Like I live this life. Like I am prior to this carnivore diet. Like I'm like kale shakes in the morning and, oh. and, I, and I, even still, I, I, I eat tons of meat anyway. Like I'm an O positive guy. And I think that meat processes well in my system. So, um, I've always eaten a lot of just animal product, but, um, but yeah, so I don't, like a McDonald's or Skyline or something. I, I don't put that kind of stuff happening. in my system. Almost never. Uh, <laughs> but with that being said, if I was going to cheat, 100% would have to be Skyline. There we go. There it is. But don't pollute your body. It's your body yeah, I mean, is listen, your temple. You got, you got your brand. You got your Cincinnati brands. You got your Jeff Ruby restaurants. You got your Montgomery and ribs. You got your uh, Skyline or Gold Star, depending on what you're a fan of. Grater's ice cream, Buskin oh, Bakery. Yes. I've not been to Buskin yet. No, they got some I've good stuff. That. Yeah, I'll, they got some good stuff. I'm on it. I'm, I'm on it. Hey, listen, I'm telling you for real. We walk into Teak and they're like, "Hey, Renee, John, how you guys doing?" Man, I will walk right back out of that restaurant. <laughs> I promise you, I will save our Teak experience for you. It will be an evening. I'll put on real pants that aren't sweatpants. <laughs> that oh, you don't means, have to do. Listen, no, no, don't do I that because then that means I got to put on real pants. So <laughs> I got to come... set the standard with the good pants. No, I'll come down there in my flip flops and shorts. I'm good with that. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Rich, thank you so much for uh, for coming on the sessions. Really looking forward to one X, uh, and then grabbing some dinner later. Awesome. Sounds like a plan. Listen, stay in touch. Let me know what you think of the show. And uh, after you watch, tell me which your favorite fight was. I will do that. There's going to be, because I'm telling you, we didn't talk about all 20 matches, but there's so many matches on this card where people are going to be like, wow, I didn't realize that match was on here. Wow, that was an amazing match. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to check it out. Also, I will say, being a, a mom that's always up early, I like that the fights are at 8 a.m. That's my yeah. speed. Give me that yeah. all day, every day. Breakfast yeah, I, and pugilism. I got a, I got a, I got a call. I got a 4 a.m. Produ uh, production call that day. So I'm like, oh, I'm not gosh. happy about that. Joe. No, that's not fun. That's yeah. not good. Just pass it's it all off to Mansuri. He's got it, it. It's especially not fun when half the time you're working until 4 a.m. Because I'm on the other side of the planet. Yeah. And then suddenly like, oh, well, now we need you to wake up at 4 a.m. So Rough. anyway, but all right. Well, listen, uh, I'll, watch I'll the let show, you know what I like. All right. And we'll grab some dinner. Definitely. Awesome. Thanks, Renee.